So Lori, what happened yeah. to you? Okay, so let me give you some of my family's, um, let me give you some background and why this is really important to me. Um, my great-great-grandmother was sexually molested. My great-grandmother was sexually molested. My grandmother was sexually molested. My mother was sexually molested. I was sexually molested. So when I, I remember when I was eight years old, um, I remember right in the middle of him having me touch him, I said to myself, this will never happen to my child. And so literally from the time I was that young all the way until I had kids, I did everything. I studied child molesters. I read books. I mean, just every single thing, right? Yeah. So I thought I was pretty prepared, right? Well, long story short, I ended up getting married. Um, him and I had a daughter together. And June the 9th, 2010, um, I was on the way taking my daughter to the airport um, to, so she could visit her father for this summertime to go to Austin, Texas. So I'm driving along and um, I always ask her, always say, well, if anybody ever makes you feel uncomfortable, you know, you can tell me anything and, you know, I'll believe you and I'll, um, and I'll choose you. Well, I've been asking her that for hundreds of times since she was little, but this time her answer was different. Mm -hmm. And she says, well, mom, his name is Tony. He's a convicted child molester, so we can say his name. <laughs> so, nice. um, so she's like, um, well, well, mom, um, well, when I one day you were at work and I went into Tony's room to use his his phone and he began to masturbate. And um, when I heard her say that, you know, he had masturbated and then she had sort of so showed me what how he did it or whatever. So I knew beyond a shadow of doubt she was telling the truth. But when she gave me that extra detail. I really knew. So basically, I put her on the airplane, you know, uh, told her I'm going to take care of everything, got back in the car, went home. Now, my ex-husband, he was my husband at the time. My other two girls were at home with him still. So I got in the car and I drove down there uh, to go back to the, to, to the apartment. Um, before I even cut off the car, before I even took the key out the ignition, I had called 911. Mm -hmm. I called 911. I was like, my daughter just told me my husband was, you know, sexually molested her. And I just put her on the airplane. And they were like, well, man, you just put her on the airplane. Uh, we can't do anything. We can't take your word from it for it. And I don't know what made me say this. Mm -hmm. But I said, well, what if I can get a confession for him? What if I can get it on tape? His name is Detective White. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia. I love him to death. Um, he said, well... Miss Mitchell, if you think you can get it on tape, then here's your case number. He gave me a case number right then and there, so I knew I had to be on a mission, okay? So <laughs> I walked into the house and um, walked into the house. And I, now, at this moment, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Like, I'm literally shaking and walking afraid because if, if my husband at the time could be a child molester, he could be a murderer. Sure. Like, I didn't know him. At that moment, he was an instant stranger to me, and I was... There. Yeah, totally. And plus, and plus, he knew what type of person I was. He knew that if anybody ever touched my kids in a sexual way, like he, he, they would pay. Just like he's paying for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I thought, you know, if I confronted him, so I was a little scared. And plus, I had to get my girls out the way. So what I went to do, I went home and I started packing me and the girl stuff up. He's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "You know, Legend just told me that somebody's been best with her. All right, now I can't be around any men because I didn't want to tell him it was him." He was like, "No, that's okay." So we agreed for him to go ahead and move to go to the hotel. So he went, and about a couple hours later, he called. He's like, "Well, can we talk?" And I was like, "Okay." And I had got up enough nerve to confront him. But it, I wanted to make sure we were going to do it in a, a public place because, again, I was scared, right? Yeah. So I went ahead and picked him up from the um, from the hotel. We went to the Applebee's and we sat down. And as soon as my butt hit the chair, I was like, it's you. It's you. <laughs> she told me, it's you, buddy. And he was like, me? Me? Why would I like a little girl? Me? me? Yeah. I can't believe she said that. I can't believe she said that. And I'm just looking at him like, Mm -hmm. So that went on his little Oscar performance. Anyway, end up dropping him off at the hotel, went back to the house about two o'clock in the morning. I hear the doorbell ding, ding, and I thought he was coming there to kill us. I really did. So I was up, but I paid, pretend like I was asleep real quick. And so he came in there and he did like this, you know, like trying to wake me up. I was like, I was like, yeah. He's like, Shh. and he's like this. Now the reason why he did this because. I always tape. I tape every damn thing. So that's why I was able to tell the, the detective, what if I get it on tape? I taped all the time. He knew that. So he thought the tape recorder was in the bedroom. So he called me at the bedroom. Like, oh, he so he knew. He knew that he you knew. tape everything. Gotcha. Everybody, yeah. 
He pulled me out the, the bedroom, right? So he closed the bedroom door. But what he didn't know, that the universe was on my side and the, the tape recorder was literally right there in the fucking living room, right there waiting for his <laughs> confession. So literally he brought me in there and he just started vomiting. Literally, he was just like, it's true, it's true, it's all true. Everything she said is true. It's true, it's true, it's all true. So wow. I'm devastated. I'm completely devastated. And here's where, here's where he was able to give me the details because... I was so devastated. I asked him, I said, you got to tell me how I missed it. Like, you have to tell me how I missed it. I mean, like, I read every book. I talked to the girls. You name it. For, if, if, I did every single thing. And you know what he told me? Hmm. He said, you didn't do anything wrong. He said, what was, what was uh, the, the issue was I made everything look normal. So if the girls ever did come to you, it was just going to be normal. Oh, and then let me break it down to you since you said I can go there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, okay, so on my TikTok, I teach. The reason why I made the TikTok anyway, because I never want another mother ever or a child to go through that pain again. So if I can help you guys to look out for some stuff, oh, God, please let me do that. Yeah. So he gave me details, and I share with everybody. So I call it the accidentally on purpose exposure or the accidentally on purpose touch now i'm going to tell you how he broke down his accidentally on purpose exposure okay so if he wanted to expose his penis to my daughter okay and you want to make it in a normal sign accidentally on purpose way well okay so one day he said i knew for a fact you had went to work i walked you to the car gave you a kiss and said bye he went in the bathroom got completely naked made sure he was aroused turned his uh towel right where you know it could be pointed out he goes in my daughter's room pretending like like it's not out. Like, hey, did your mother go to work yet? That is called an accidentally on purpose exposure. It's sort of because he's doing it, but if if you call him out on it, you can. It could really be flipped if you're really not looking for that thing until like an accident, or maybe he just didn't. You know. So that's one way he did it. Um, okay, that is so accurate. It's funny you mentioned that because so the guy who molested me. He would come into the room late at night and would would sleep, at, you know, quote, quote, unquote, yeah. sleep next to the bed. Um, and when we went to court, he testified and said that the reason that he did that was because his son slept better when he was in the room. And so it's sort of this alibi where it's like, yes. you know, yes. it, it really has in theory, it could be true. In theory, yes. your your ex-husband could be saying like, you know, maybe maybe he did just happen to have his dick out like and, yes. and they're and that's what I feel like there's a misconception with pedophiles which is that they're like just these dumb people and most of the time it's premeditated well thought out things that they're doing and that that's such a great way to put it accidentally on purpose exposure or the accidentally on purpose uh, touch I came up with that because my uh, abuser used to accidentally on purposely touch me you know oh it was an accident no it was on purpose okay so what I want to I wanted to sort of take you into the mindset of a child molester okay now my daughter came to me one day and she said be because he had accidentally walked in her own bathroom or whatever and um, she said, he walked in on me. I said, okay. I said, well, what happened? What did he do? And she said, she said, well, when he walked in, he did like this. Like he was startled, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, she's telling me about him walking in there. It seemed like an accident. His his uh, reaction seemed like an accident. It must have been an accident, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? That was way much. When he confessed to me, he said, oh, by the way. Remember that time when Legend Kramer told you that I accidentally walked in the bathroom on her? No. Wasn't an accident. He said, he said I actually was standing outside the door waiting for her to turn off the shower and then and, and look for the exact same time when she walked out and walked in and was like, Oh, I'm sorry. That's how they do it. I mean, it's yeah. so freaking normal. It's the perfect alibi too, because it's like, you know, nobody can really say definitively that you did something like that on purpose. But it's so obvious in retrospect that that that's what's was what was going on. Yeah, because people walk in, accidentally walking on people all the time. Sure. So that was just boom. So he told me lots of things like that. Um, basically, he said he just made every single thing look really, really normal. Oh, 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 parents, parents, please listen to me. It's so very important to have these constant and consistent talks with your children. Not only because you're educating them, but guess what else you're doing? Let me tell you what I found out. I would have those sexual abuse talks with my kids 
all the time, like all the, all the time. So I didn't know it was bothering my ex-husband. So this is what he told me. He said, remember when you used to always have those talks with the girls? I said, yep. He said, you never no- noticed that I used to leave the room? Oh. I said, I said, I just thought you was giving us, you know, privacy. Mm-hmm. You know? He says, no. I hate it when you used to talk to the girls about that. Because I knew I'd have to slow down on praying on them. I knew I'd have to be careful. For that week that you were talking, I knew I was going to hat back up and have to control my urges. This is what he told me. Wow. I mean, that's enough reason in and of itself to have these conversations with your kids. It it can be that simple. Like, in terms of educating your kids and making sure they know that, like, this stuff happens. And, like, you don't, it's not that you need to be afraid of all adults but you need to kids have to be armed with like the right language to express what's happening to them and right now in the way that our society is handling this issue people are people would prefer to just not bring this up with their kids because it makes them uncomfortable and just risk them getting molested without any way to to get out of it but that is that is so fascinating and i'm curious like why did he tell you all of this that is the one question that every I have not been able to answer, especially because he knew that I taped. Matter of fact, on some of the, on one of the tape, you hear him say, "I know you're probably taping." Wow. I, mean, I, I don't know. I honestly think that he he really didn't know. I honestly, well, I don't honestly. I can't. I, I've been trying to answer that for ten years. Yeah. I just know I'm thank God he did because even with the tape, the DA still wanted to give him probation. So I'm just asking. what. Yeah. And he he confessed to over 80 different things. I literally stopped counting. I literally stopped counting because the DA was like, you got to stop sending us these tapes because he confessed over like um, 11 day time. Like you just kept confessing and talking. I, I, I played it off really good. Like I'm on the tapes saying, I totally understand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I had to play it off. People were like, well, how did you get it? I was like, I played it very cool. Very cool. And despite all of that evidence, the, what was the DA, what did they say to you when they were like, yeah, we're going to try to give him probation? No collaboration, no crime. Check this out. Because because my daughter, of most of it happened when she was asleep. A child who sleep can't coll- collaborate it. Yo, we're not even asleep most of the time. We're awake. We're just fucking playing possum. I don't have. I'm not trying to be having a conversation with the dude who's molesting me. Yo, this is so silly. Exactly. Exactly. But obviously that that didn't happen though because he was convicted and oh yeah yeah that didn't happen because when I got in front of the judge I told I told on the DA I told I told on everybody I was like I'm not happy with the damn DA (laughs) (laughs) this bullshit this bullshit probation I I went off I was like I was like no matter of fact so I went to I went to the court and they were like you know talking or whatever and I'm like man I I ain't I ain't down for this probation shit I never been in the court so I just raised my hand like this <laughs> judge was like uh yeah go ahead I was like uh-uh this uh uh-uh, that, that probation is bullshit no I said matter of fact he needs some years in jail and a minimum he needs a minimum of 15 years of probation because I had at the time our daughter together was only like five or something so I needed you know I needed him to be on probation the whole time until she got of age or whatever yeah. so yeah the judge sided with me so that's how we got more than that wow I needed you in my court case that would have been amazing if you could <laughs> be in the uh, in the audience raising your hand in, in my defense that's um that's pretty sweet that you were that you were able to do that and that the, that the judge just called out you like a classroom that's I know huge. right I was like I don't know yeah everything's been really pretty much working on my side as far as the universe putting everything into place like yeah. TikTok I mean I mean, let's talk about my TikTok growth, okay? Now, yeah. I did some research. Now, even though my numbers are pretty good, you know, I'm about 250,000K. Wow. Um, I got that in a relatively short amount of time, like four months. Um, uh-huh. But they said that for topics that are super, super serious, if we get any type of numbers, they're like, like, they're like times 10. Because our topic is so heavy, people, it's really hard for me to get followers. Because one, like less than 10% of the male population is going to follow me. Then we got a whole bunch of mothers who, unfortunately, that's what I found out. A lot of moms, 
my first book is going to be about mom. Some mothers know their kids are being sexually molested, and then some mothers find out and they kick their their daughters out. I, I didn't know that stuff was going on. Until yeah, it. I've had people on the podcast who have talked about speaking up about their experience to their parents and having them not believe them for whatever reason. And oftentimes it's because it's family members who are doing it. That forces the family to have to reevaluate all of their their whole existence, basically. And it's so common for people to not be believed about these things. And I think a big yes. part of it comes down to just like a lack of education. Like people have yeah. no idea how big of a problem this is, which is why it's so great to have, you know, people like yourself speaking up about it and that you've garnered this following. That's I mean, that's a that's a crazy amount of people. But it is it is interesting. I feel like TikTok has a tendency to suppress this kind of information generally yeah like like the, the, like tiktok i went from getting at five thousand followers minimum every single day and i had to take some time out because i deal with a very heavy subject so i took about 21 days off when i came back on i i hit the biggest shadow ban on planet earth like yeah. I like 50 followers now it's like okay yeah but what i do as um people who are in the essay um community we don't really focus on numbers anyway i'm just going to focus on the 250 that i got and just really help them out and whoever comes comes and i can help them as well but i try not to focus on the numbers i do wish i was out there more because it's literally 39 million of us in the united states 39 million uh abused abused survivors wow most will never tell us so and here's why if you have ever been sexually abused this is why you have to tell your child your story. Because if you have been sexually abused, your child has a 50% of being sexually abused. This mm. is why we have to share our stories with our children, no matter how painful it is. So you said if, if you've been sexually abused, your, your child, child has, has a 50% <laughs> more likely chance. Of being sexually abused. Wow, why, do you, why is that? Oh, it's so hard to explain. I, it's something to do with the way we choose or the way we, there is an explanation and I always forget it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it probably depends on if you've spoken up or not. Like if you, if you were abused and you've spoken up and were believed, presumably had like a positive experience, as positive as it can be, you know, people believed you and, and you were able to get out of the situation. But I think especially if you were abused and you never spoke up about it, I think that you're probably much less likely to believe your kid if it did happen because that causes you to come to terms with the fact that you were molested too. And yeah. this is one thing that I that I realized kind of recently actually is that like most of the time when people don't believe kids who were abused, it's because of something internal on their own end. It's because yeah. of their own experiences. Maybe somebody that they care about was accused of something similar uh, or yeah. maybe it happened to them too. But it's it never has anything to do with the kid. And yeah. I actually recently made a TikTok about that, about how like there will always be people who don't believe you, but that's not a reason to not speak up. You just have to recognize that it is it has nothing to do with you. Um, exactly. But yeah, the numbers are really staggering. Um, and like you said, that's of reported cases. The majority of people never report. So the numbers are even higher than, than we can imagine. But I wanted to hear like what actually happened? Because you said like you had multiple family members that were molested. With you specifically, what was your experience like? My experience was, um, my, I got sexually molested when I started at eight years old by my, uh, my stepdad. And uh, so he began to groom me, um, you know, the grooming. He, uh, I think it's the very first grooming that I remember, recall him doing was, again, the accidentally on purpose brush up against my breast that I didn't have because I was only eight years old. Uh -huh. um, and he sort of played it off like he sort of walked by and pinched it. And he, I was like, oh, so I went and told my mom. I was like, mom, he touched my breast. And she was like, oh, I'm just kidding with her. He, 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 he. Yeah. And that's how, he, yeah. And so he started grooming me that way. Every day I would come home and he might be sitting on the couch or whatever and have his, you know, whatever thing out or whatever. So he slowly but surely groomed me that way. Um, I think he took my virginity. Mm -hmm. How old was I? I don't know. See, he groomed me. Eight and... There's no way I was more, more than 10 years old when he took my virginity. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, so he much pretty much took everything. It stopped when I was in the ninth grade. How did it stop? My, him and my mom broke up. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's how I stopped. Um, I was always outspoken about child, uh, always. So I told my mother, 
uh, she didn't believe me. I told her again, and then, uh, then uh, finally, I told her. I told her like four times or whatever. And my really? whole life, I've always been extremely outspoken. Like at Christmas, Thanksgiving, I'm talking about sexual abuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm and Lord forbid, if, if the uncle's there, he's a child molester. I'm warning, warning. Like I'm very vocal. Yeah. I've always been that way. The very first time he touched my breath, a period, I, that very instantly, right there, I told her. And she she thought he was playing, like, because he told her that. Right. And then um, when I tried to tell her maybe a year or so after that, um, again, she just, just, I don't know, whatever. She just didn't believe me or whatever. Um, and then w- the last time I told her, I was like, no, he did it. She's like, well, what did he do? And I told her everything in detail. I'm like, everything that you guys did? <laughs> to me, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's yeah. Like, what do you mean? I'm like every single thing, penetration and all. Yeah, she was, she's like, well, why you took so long to tell me? You must have liked it. What do you? But I forgave my mother for that. Why? Ask me why. Why? Well, my mother didn't even find out she was a product of incest until she was 50 years old. They kept that a secret. Whoa. From her. They kept it for a secret from her. Then on top of that, her. She was bl- my mother was raped by so many men by the age ten. It was ridiculous. So when my grandmother blamed her, it was natural for her to blame me. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. so once you understand why your parents are doing certain things, then you sort of can have a little bit of compassion. When my, I found out my mother, she didn't have a chance. Like it was way worse for her. So yeah, that's amazing that you're able to look at that experience with empathy towards your mom and the rest of your family. And it goes back to your point about how you are more like your kids more likely to be molested if you have been molested. And I think it does sort of just tie back to your own experiences and also your personal involvement. Like if you're if you are telling the truth, then your mom has to find a new boyfriend uh, or a uh, husband. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yes. Yes. So See? it's it, it. it's so complicated, but it's I, it's really amazing that you did keep speaking up. You know, I feel like so oftentimes people will speak up once and then they're not believed. And it's so much harder to be like to keep speaking up after that. And, you know, I also felt like when I was getting molested, I felt like when I didn't speak up the first time, I felt like it became harder to speak up with each additional molestation that, it, that yes. I experienced because of the exact reason that your mom presented of mm-hmm. people will be like, oh, well, you liked it. You you let it go on for two years. Like you must have enjoyed it. And that was super embarrassing to me. And I didn't know I, I didn't. It just became so hard to speak up. And people say that in the TikTok comments oftentimes. And it's actually like it's really it's TikTok's a great opportunity to expose the logic that so many people are trapped in with molestation, like people that are like critical of kids who enjoyed these experiences as if that would make it okay. Like that's what's so interesting about your mom's logic in that particular scenario is that do you think that she was saying you must have liked it, therefore it was okay? Or was she just pointing out that you must have liked it? I am almost positive my mother herself as a victim bought into the idea of this is not something that's done to me. This is an an, an even exchange. Like if they would give my mother money, you know, to keep her quiet and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure my mother bought into the thing of this being a tit for tat thing. You give me money and, you know, she really did. Because I can tell, yeah, she did. So maybe she just thought, Maybe that's how I, you know, I don't even know. No, I, so I, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think you're probably right about that. And I saw something recently that um, it was just a quick quote. And it was like, arousal does not mean consent. And it really is so accurate. And people brush off so many kids' testimonies because of the arousal aspect of it, even though it's not something that they can prevent from happening. Like, I remember when I was getting, I would get boners while I was getting molested. And I would be like, fuck, like, what, what is going on here? And I would get mad at myself for having a boner because I was like, now this guy's going to think that I like this. And then he's going to do it more. And it's yeah. this massively complex thing to be trying to figure out as a 10-year-old. I mean, I was eight when it started as well. Um, but w- whatever age you're at, um, it's so important to recognize that, your body will respond to these things naturally. It doesn't matter who is touching you. You are not responsible for this happening at, because your body is responding to it. So I totally empathize with you there. Did you see my video? I literally said, 
yes, I have had an orgasm from the things my abuser did to me. Because I need to set some people free. It's too many of us up here being hard on ourselves because we done had an orgasm because something he did. Dude, that's how the body works. That's I right. My body is working the way the creator wanted it to, okay? So if anybody rub me down there a certain way, it's going to have an orgasm. Yeah. So I, 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 for some reason, I'm so glad. I never felt shame or blame about that, the way my body worked. This is the way my damn body worked. And I was just like you. I used to hate it in my head. In my head, I'm like, no, don't move. It's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you're the audience oh, so mad. Like, oh, yeah. Know? Yeah, but I, so many people had such an issue with that. Um, a lot of things, like some people um, still to this day, and if they're with their husband or something like that, they can't have an orgasm without thinking about their abuser mm. or they just might not can be touched or anything like that. So that's another thing I really like to um, help people with and let them know that. It's normal. Everything we go through is normal. Yeah, totally. It just takes people being willing to accept what happened to them and speak up without shame about it, which is what you're doing. And it's so empowering. I mean, even just now, for me, hearing about it, it's really awesome to hear it. I totally agree. And I also wanted to ask you, like, it's been in your family, these experiences for, for quite some time. And now you're at a point where as soon as your daughter told you, you were able to put a stop to it. And, and I just wanted to ask, like, what do you think are the optimal precautions to take in order to prevent these things from happening? And then what's the best way to respond when you find out? Okay. Okay. If you are a parent, it is very, very crucial that you ask your child consistently and constantly. Just something simple. Does anybody ever make you feel uncomfortable? You know I believe you and you know I'll choose you. I know you you literally have to drill. We think that our kids know oh, my kid knows I love my kids know I would choose it. My kid, no, no, your kid doesn't. Your kid doesn't. Yeah. You, you have to drill it because my daughter would tell you straight up. I knew for a fact the moment my, my I told my mom she was gonna believe me, it was gonna be smoke in the city. You they have to be consistent with their talks. Constantly, constantly, constantly ask them, ask them, ask them. Is anything going on? Because a kid, if it's going on, you, you know, when you're being molested, you go through those waves of bravery. Right? Yeah. You know, I, like my mom, like if she would have came and asked me one day and I was scared, I'd be like, no. But when I was mad, like, oh, I wish you would ask me today. So I would ask my kids all the time, just, you know, meet them at, you know, bravery and the opportunity. And then she told. But so to, to ask them a lot, to constantly, constantly ask them, um, inquire about if the, anything's going on. Um, if something does happen, you just need to take your child's side, period, point blank. I don't care if it's just your husband, if, if, it's your, if it's your grandpa, whatever. You need to let that child know in every way, shape, or form that you got them, that yeah. you're on their side. So even that, if that's moving them out, if, this, if that's, you know, you really just need to know that's the time when a child really, really knows that, um, that you have their back, basically. That's awesome. I totally agree with everything you said. You're talking about the future of your relationship with your child. You, mm -hmm. your, your kid is not going to trust you again if you don't believe them when they're speaking up about something like this. Yeah. That's the thing. When parents don't believe their kids, I, I, I assume that the majority of them are not trying to damage their kids. Right. They're probably trying to protect them and preserve the relationships that they have with the members of the family that were accused of being abused. But the reality is you're quite literally doing the opposite and you're doing lasting damage that will have effects for potentially ever if they don't get treated. So I think it's just to recognize like you have an opportunity as a parent when your kid speaks up to save them. I mean, literally like, and build a relationship that's stronger than it ever was between you and your kid. <laughs> Clearly you have an amazing relationship with your daughter now too. Yeah, it makes all the difference in the world. My daughter can get on here on TikTok. She's actually been on some of my TikTok before. She, she, it makes all the difference. And I knew I needed to be there for her. Exactly, I needed to tell her constantly, it's not your fault. All those things that I wanted to hear as a child, I just fed into her and she's, She's extremely well-rounded. She can talk about sexual abuse all day long to never feel uncomfortable about it. That's amazing. What do you think about education and, and how the schools are handling this kind of stuff at the moment? Um, what do you think would be some changes that need to happen with regards to the educational approach to child abuse? I, oh, first of, the first thing I think needs to change is this, the mandatory reporting. Teachers don't do they're supposed to mandatory report. They don't. 
that's that's that one that that needs to change because I understand. But I've talked to a lot of teachers and they said, well, you know, they're sort of afraid, you know, because if they if they get into it and it turns out to not be right, they're just afraid that something could happen to their job and stuff like that. They don't feel like they have enough power. That's what they said. They don't feel like they have enough power just to just say that and it be something or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But I honestly think there needs to be. There need to be a whole class just for that. And like a 30 minutes class just for that. Um, to I heard there's something called Aaron's Law. And I believe they teach that in school. Aaron's so Law? Aaron's Law. One of my friends from TikTok told me she's starting to teach it. It's a it's a program that they actually teach in school about um sexual abuse and things like that. Mm-hmm. So that is um that's out there. It's not I don't think it's in Texas yet. It might be. I'm not for sure. But something like that, something like Aaron's Law. We need something in the school because when we leave home, school is our safest place. Yeah. It's safest place for us. We need to be able to say something to some people. Especially you know? if you feel like you can't tell your family about it. I mean, that's like the absolute, it's such an important outlet and resource for kids to have. Another question I have for you with regards to TikTok is like you look at Charlie D'Amelio, right? She blew up when she was 15 years old and she's in a bathing suit in a large percentage of her videos. And, you know, you look at all the TikTok trends and they're all so sexual. Almost every one of them is twerking some sort of sexualization of the people that are in the videos. So do you think that TikTok is doing more harm than good? I think TikTok is an app that is worried about their numbers. And when Charlie is in a bathing suit, that gets numbers. So I think TikTok is like a corporation. So they talk, corporations don't have feelings. They don't have a, it's not like, oh, they're going to look at my cause. Like, oh, she's here to save the world. No. It, so TikTok is an app. It's a corporation. They have no hearts. It, it, that's what they do. Um, sexual sexual abuse is never going to, um, you know what I'm saying? It's never going to be like the, the happening thing. They're yeah. going to push out the happening thing. They're going to push out TikTok beefs and, and this is and that. that. That's them. Um, I think you're right. I think TikTok is going to put out the content that keeps people on the app the most. That's their only goal. And I think rather maybe TikTok isn't the problem, but TikTok is highlighting a problem with our species, which is yeah. that the content that the that people want to consume on TikTok is children sexualizing themselves. Yes. And, you know, obviously TikTok will never take responsibility for that. They're just like, this is what the algorithm puts out. Right. Like, of course, exactly. that it, it makes sense. Right. <laughs> But it it really is like, do you watch the show Black Mirror? I used to. Okay. No so it's sort of hypothetical future scenarios that are sort of like dystopian futures, right? I mean, you think about what TikTok is in a sense. There has never been an app before where a 15-year-old girl can go on and do some dumb dance and get 100 million followers. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and on TikTok, you know, obviously... Anybody can make an account anonymously. There's no age restrictions, there's no age check, and anyone can download the videos. It it really does seem like this sort of dystopian app that is covered up under this veil of innocent dancing. But if you think about what TikTok is actually doing, they're pushing out this content to people who would have otherwise never seen children doing the WAP, right? Yes, you're so right. So it's weird to think about in that regard. And like, you, what what impacts are you having on our species by putting this stuff on people's For You page? I don't know. <laughs> I think they should at least have an age limit or something because yeah. I couldn't believe 13, how many 13 year olds follow me. I mm. mean, I was like, whoa, 13, 14, 15, so... Yeah, there should at least be an 18 or over or something, but... Yeah, but then it's like at the same... Yeah, it's like at the same time, you, of course, want your content to reach people of all ages, you know? You don't want anybody to to be excluded from this. So that being said, it's like whether or not we stop posting on TikTok isn't going to make a difference in terms of the content (laughs) that they're showing to people, so... People ask me, said, um, how how do you feel about... um, Do you think child molesters come to your page? I'm like, hell yeah, they come to my page! page." (laughs) Said, well, do you think they ever like get their jollies up? I said, hell yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, they come to see what 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 we know, and also some of them come because it turns them on. 
child molesters definitely visit my page. Oh yeah, they're probably trying to figure out what are people, what are survivors talking about? What do I need to avoid? But I mean, that's inevitable. You're doing so much more good than harm, and it's like, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, maybe you're having, maybe child molesters are going to your page and realizing after seeing all of these, after hearing your story and other survivors' stories, that this isn't something that they should be doing. You know, it isn't necessarily all bad. Who knows? But, um, I, doubt if they do. I doubt they can change that quick. Yeah, if only. Oh, uh, let me ask you this. How do you feel about, okay, how do you feel about justice versus social justice? Because a lot of us do not, I got justice, my daughter did, but a lot of us, that's our big thing, we didn't get justice. And I always tell people, you know what's better than justice? Social justice. How do yeah. you feel about that? That is a great question. I I feel more fulfilled helping even one person speak up about their experience than I think I would feel if the guy who abused me had been convicted. Um, I don't feel any sort of attachment to the outcome of that trial. At the time, oh, I, yeah, I just didn't want it to be going on anymore. I just didn't want to get molested anymore. I didn't really care if you went to jail or not. But a lot of people in the in the TikTok comments are like, let's go kill this guy, you know, like, let's go find yeah. him. Or like, yeah. I'm so sorry you didn't get justice. And I, I totally understand why people feel that way. But I think that there is a massive amount of value in letting go of what's happened in the past with regards to this kind of stuff and, and things in general, but like, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, obviously it, it probably would have been nice to get a conviction and have more people believe me at the time, but I definitely think you're right. Social justice is one, it's something that's in our control, which is amazing. And two, I just don't, I don't think it's good to be dependent on the outcome of the law for you to feel okay. Um, yeah. And I don't think you need to be dependent on it, which is nice because I think a lot of people feel like they almost need closure from their abuser. You know yeah. what I mean? And uh, while I do understand that, I think that there is a lot of value in just sort of recognizing that you can't change what's happened, but you can make a massive amount of impact on other people's lives and your own by just being willing to share your story. Yeah. What do you think? I believe, I mean, so I'm the type of person that if you touch my child, I'm coming after you for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. Period, point blank. Yeah. So let not only did I put him in jail, he got out of jail. But you know those tape confessions that I told you about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he sort of made me mad. And the whole Facebook posted. He lost job. He, I, I have, this man has lost jobs. Yeah. He lost his church home. He lost his home. He's lost all kind of things. If you touch my child, I'm coming after you for the rest of your fucking life. So when I say social justice, what I mean is all those things, but I'm going, I plan on making him the most popular child molester on planet Earth. That, <laughs> he's going to be Larry Nassar and Sandusky. No, no, no. That's what I mean by social justice. I mean by shaming them. It's his time to be shamed. That's what I mean by social justice. I mean, yeah. his name, that's what I mean. It's time to take our power back. And I'm tired of these people being all hidden and comfortable living. No, 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 no. We don't call you out by your fucking name and give your address too. You know, so yeah, yeah, he, he's really messed up. Like, yeah, but I still got some more for him. Yeah, you, you fucked with the, uh, he fucked with the wrong. Uh, one. <laughs> now he has to pay forever. Yeah. So is he, is he in jail? Uh, how much indefinitely or what, what's the. He, 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 he got sentenced 15 years served three. He only served two years. He been out. He's happily married. He's been, he's been out for a year, four or five, four or five years now. Yeah. Wow, that's wild. So he was sentenced to 15, but only got three. Yeah, the, literally the judge said, bam, uh, your sentence is 15 years, serve three. That's exactly how she read it. So I guess if he were to mess up, he can go back, but no, he's out. Yeah, he's been out. Ah, it's so wild that even, cause what they're saying is, yes, you molested a child. That It's not like a half conviction, like to go right. to jail, it has to have happened. And that's right. the punishment we're giving you is three years. Like that doesn't make any fucking sense at all. But yeah. I'm so happy to hear that you're still enacting your own social justice. It's, it's, it's great. I ain't never letting it go. Ah, not mine. <laughs> so what about, um, you were able to speak up right away, even though you weren't believed. Mm -hmm. But what do you think allowed, because I, I forget if you had mentioned this earlier or not, but had you already heard about your family's history of sexual abuse? No, not when I was being abused, no. Okay, so 
What what is it do you think that really allowed you to speak up right away? And that's I don't that's what I um I don't know. I just I think I'm outspoken and then for some reason talking about that subject just I always just seem to just flow off my tongue easy. I don't know. Yeah. And then you gotta remember, I never ever blamed myself once. Yeah. I never was I not for once. I never felt guilty about any of that. For even as a young child, I knew for a fact it didn't have shit to do with me. This was not my fault. Right. So I never went to the blame. I didn't go through a lot of things that a lot of survivors go through. I just had a, a very good understanding of it at a young age and so a lot of it didn't really it bothered me but not really like like shame I wasn't shamed like oh not like things like that so yeah it's fascinating to me though just as somebody who didn't speak up right away um yeah. because I think obviously that would be the ideal thing is if kids just immediately said something right that would be yeah. that's sort of the goal and and what we're what we're trying to get to um so yeah who knows but definitely can being I ask a question yeah of course why do you think men don't speak up that much? I think a big part of it is the masculinity aspect. And even at that age, right? I hadn't gone through puberty yet, but I still knew that I, I was a dude and it just felt weird to have had this experience with another dude. Okay, um, okay. It's not a very manly thing to get molested in the way that society presents men and masculinity these days. You want to be tough, you know, and like part of it could be just the fact that it's not as known. You know, this stuff is generally associated with happening to women. Um, yeah. And so I think it comes down to awareness. And if there were a bunch of men that were super outspoken about their experiences, I can imagine it would be a lot more encouraging for other men to come forward. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't know to answer your question. It's hard to pinpoint the exact reason, but I think it comes down to both of those things. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just remember feeling so embarrassed uh, while it was going question. on. Yeah, 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 please. Okay, so is there a big difference when guys tell if it was a guy or a woman? Does it is it equally hard for you guys to tell somebody if, if you got molested by a woman versus a guy, or is it just me? Yeah, I, I well, I don't know because I, I obviously I've only had my experience, but I mm -hmm. I can't imagine that it's. I think it affects both people equally. I don't think that there's any sort of difference in that regard. But I think that the, it's it's the masculinity aspect that makes guys feel maybe an additional uh, need to suppress it. Like we're not really brought up to express our emotions. Um, yeah. And it's a super emotional thing to go through. And it very often makes you sad and makes you cry. And those are not characteristics of a manly man in, in today's world. But in terms of the actual experience, I, I don't think that there's any difference between men and women. It's just, just as traumatizing no matter who you are. Feeling like you can't express yourself. Um, and knowing that if you were to speak up, it would require a lot of expression and a lot of sadness. And I think that those are things that men aren't taught to, to feel these days, which is super sad and like unfortunate that that's the state of things. But, um, is that kind of answer, answer your question? Yeah, but I got another question and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but I, I've been... Not at all. I, I, okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, Donnie McClurklin? No, who's that? Okay, well, he and he's a famous singer, or whatever. He got molested, right? Mm -hmm. Now he says that he, by his uncle, he says that he thinks that's why he's interested in guys. I want to have a question. Yeah, I know you can be born gay. I know that, right? Right? Uh, yeah. And then I know maybe can you can you be straight and then that turn you that way. Or what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, so this, I actually do a stand up bit about this because while it was going on, like I said, I would get boners, right? So yeah. that was enough for me at that age to conclude that I was gay. So, so I was just like, in my head, I was just like, all right, well, I guess I'm into dudes, even though there wasn't any sort of attraction. I wasn't looking at guys and being attracted to them. Yeah. Yeah. But but at the time, that was just where my head was at. That was the logic that I was capable of, you know, coming up with. So yeah. 
Basically, as soon as I spoke up, I felt very free from the feelings that I had been having. I felt like I wasn't confined to the logic that I was using because I quickly realized that this is not something that should have been happening. Like yeah. this is an uh, this is not this is not a reasonable experience to be having, right? right? So I sort of was like, okay, well, maybe the way that I was thinking wasn't exactly right either. But yeah. I definitely don't feel like I'm not attracted to dudes. I, I just, I, it just doesn't do it for me. I don't know what to tell you. Whether or not that's, that's a result of being molested or not, I don't know. Um, I always find it kind of difficult to pinpoint things that I do sexually and be like, okay, well, I'm like that because I was molested. But I definitely think that no matter what age you're at, if a dude grabs your dick and you get a boner from it, you can't just be like, okay, well, no, I'm straight. I'm fine. I'm straight. You know, like it definitely makes you think, right? So, I mean, I think it also kind of depends on the level of the molestation. You know, I was not, I wasn't fortunate that it, it, but I was fortunate that it wasn't super extreme. You know, the guy never made me do anything to him. Um, it, It never really progressed past him just grabbing my dick. So I wonder. <laughs> yeah. Damn, just say it like that, grab my dick. Yeah, I mean, that's what it was, you know? It's helpful to just be blunt about it, you know? There's no, don't have to sugarcoat it at all. Yeah. But um, I think it, you know, maybe I would feel differently. I, I'm sure it would affect you more if, if like he had been raping me, for example. And maybe even more confusing. So it's very complicated. <laughs> but at the time I was like, wow, this is, I, I didn't know I was into dudes, but here we are, you know, just getting boners <laughs> while this is going on. So yeah, it's complicated. It. And you mentioned that you had orgasms while you were being abused. Um, yeah. So what was it, sort of a similar question for you? Like, was that, while that was going on, did you feel like you were enjoying it or was it, was it happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't doing it. I, I, right. I See, my music, see, a lot of people went through these horrific things. They were hurt. They were scared. I was never, ever, ever afraid of my abuser. When he touched me or whatever, the most gentlest, nothing ever, ever, ever hurt. Ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they say it felt good, it felt absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. That's just the fucking truth of it. Think about it. He was my first one. He's the one who, so if if you have your first orgasm with somebody, okay, so, so once you're you, you, you have it right there. Your brain sort of takes that same pattern, how you got there. So let me see if I can explain it. So when he rubbed me a certain way, right, and it went up, I have a full orgasm, it sort of connected to my brain like, oh, okay. So now whenever that same thing happens, it goes to that same path. Like some of the stuff that he used to do to me mm-hmm. in order for me to have an orgasm now at this late age, I have to go back to some of those things. Interesting. Because... Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, most of us are like that, but um, yeah, I have to still pull from the thing that uh, that aroused me from from get. That's that, my arousal yeah, point. that's fascinating. He, he established my arousal point, so that's what it is. So yeah. if my husband, who I, I was a virgin, uh, established that arousal point. It had been all good, but since my stepdad did, you know, it's whatever. So right, yeah. yes. Oh, I just love that you speak so openly about that because it's that's what we need to do is just acknowledge the truth of it, and there's yeah. no there's no shame in it at all. For example, like while this was right, obviously I'm getting boners while this is going on. The first time every anyone's ever touched my dick, right? So I'm like, wow, yeah. this is dope. I had no idea how good this would feel, right? But yeah. like, but then as soon as I got my first hand job, which was like, you know, six years later, right? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize it's anybody. Anyone who touches my dick is gonna make, is gonna feel awesome. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, but at the time you're just like, well, this is only if this dude does it, you know? Yeah. And, and you just, uh, you don't know any better. But that's, that's, ah, I, it's, it's so therapeutic to have these conversations, especially with somebody oh, yeah. as open and honest as you are. What advice would you give to somebody who has been through something similar to what you went through or maybe will go through something similar in the future with regards to getting to the place where you're at now? The number one thing that you have to do is you have to get comfortable with the sexual abuse talk. It needs to be as normal as what we're having for breakfast, eggs and bacon. That's what we have to make this conversation normal because as long as it's uncomfortable, we're not going to talk about it. Yes. Period. We got to get comfortable with the conversation. We just have to. 
Totally. For as long as humans have been around, presumably, this has been going on, and it's never been a topic that people are comfortable talking about. And that's, it just perpetuates the problem, like, because people can't feel like they can't bring it up. And it's also like, the reaction that people have to you bringing it up also makes it so much harder to. Oh my God, yes! And you just don't, you don't want to make anybody feel bad for what happened to you, you know? So we have to not only normalize the conversations, but normalize people telling you about this stuff. Yes. Like, you don't want to react, uh, the natural reaction, and of course there's no harm meant by it, but people will be, I'm so sorry, to, I'm so sorry this happened to you, this is so yes. horrible. And it is, you know, but if you, if I, if you make me feel bad for bringing it up, I don't want to bring it up, you know what I mean? Even like on TikTok, okay, so I see this guy doing a live, right? And they said, um, they said, if you had a warning sign stamped on you, what would it be? And mine instantly came to me was like, warning, I talk about sexual molestation. Baby, let me tell you something. That lady acted like she didn't see my shit, boy. She was like, <laughs> she looked at everybody else, warning this one. She looked like, it just makes people uncomfortable. I'm like, I know you see my damn message. Yes. But I understand the, just the words themselves make people like, oh my God. I get yeah. it. I get it. I think it just takes somebody like yourself who's willing to just no worry about how you'll be perceived, willing to put it all on the table and be like, look, this is this is a thing that happens. And until we acknowledge that it happens, we're not going to be able to make progress in fixing it. So mm -hmm. I really just applaud you for everything that you've done in your life and on TikTok. You're helping so many people. And I just uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story here. Can't, can't thank you enough, Lori. <laughs> My whole entire life, I've always wanted to uh, help people, and now I've had over a hundred people say they had never spoke a word to anybody, and I was the first. <gasps> Do you know what I yeah. I feel? Ah! Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> okay, I just love it. I'm like, what? A sixty year old, a sixty year old said, "I thought I was gonna go to my grave with this." Wow. Yeah. And she told me. Okay, so you gotta have me back. I'm writing a book called Mamas. Okay? Cool. So and so we're going to be talking about mama so um, really quickly. So there's three types of mothers when it comes to sexual abuse. There is the type one, the full participant mom. The full participant mom is very aware that her child is being sexually molested. Boom. Okay. There's a type two. The mother has no idea her child was being molested, but found out and she still let her child down. Uh, then there's type three, which is me. We didn't know. We found out and we handled our business. I'll, get, uh, I'll break all that down to you in my book, but you got to have me back. Of course, I would love to have you back. That's so cool that you're writing that. Come follow me on TikTok, Sky Blue 7. I promise I, I'm going to help you out. I promise I'm going to let you know you're not alone. And we end this together. Yes. Thank you so much for doing this, Laurie. It was a pleasure Thank talking you so to you. Much. I can't wait to have you on the podcast again soon. Thank you so much for allowing me to do this. Thank you so much. Of course. Have a good day. You too.